just hold off on eight and nine, and we'll, if our planning staff are here, can we go to item 10? It's on page 137. Um, items 10, 11, uh, 12, uh, and 13 are reasonably procedural members, um, particularly the first three. And uh, I'll ask uh, on item 10, Tony Reedy, to very briefly address item 10. Welcome, Tony. Thank and you, And if Mr. you could Chair. introduce any other staff uh, on, on this particular plan change, please. For item 10, it's just myself. I think David's coming along for item 11. And 12. And 12, yeah. So, as... I'm here, I'm here because I'm acting for Reid. So. <laughs> so item 10, just, um, it's the final step in the plan change process. We're bringing you um, two plan changes, plan change four, which was correction to technical errors and anomalies, quite a large plan change, um, which kicked off a couple of years ago, and then plan change 18, which was rezoning some land in the Tamaki area. Um, some open space land um, as part of ration, rationalisation process. Both those plan changes have been through the process. Um, decisions have been released. Appeal, there was only appeals to plan change four. They've been resolved. So now we come back to you to, as a final step to make those plan changes op operative. Um, that's really all I need to say, I suppose. Thanks, Tony. Uh, it's moved by Councillor Bartley. Uh, I'll, and do I have a second? Another second? Uh, Member Leanne Nominee. Um, any points to make? I think they have been made through the process, the, the proper process. All those in favour say aye. Contrary, no. Declare that carried. Thank you, Tony. It seems so quick and easy, but we know that you've uh, worked the hard yards on this one. Thank you. Um, item 11, and it's on page 147, um, and um, this one is your good work, David and we've resolved this as well. And this will be moved by Councillor Cashmore. Do I have a second, please? I'll just put that up. Uh, Councillor Tracy Mulholland. David. The mic, can I have your mic on? Just add that, please. Um, this, once again, uh, this is the final step in making um, Private Plan Change 6 Oranga fully operative. Uh, the appeal by um, Ali Pan, a landowner, to the location of a future collector road has been settled by consent order. All the parties to the appeal have signed off on that consent order. Uh, the Environment Court also made some changes, uh, which all parties agreed with. Uh, the plan change is beyond challenge, and the report is the final step to make the plan change fully operative. Thank you, David. I'm sure there's no need for discussion on this. Um, as I said, it's moved by Councillor Cashmore and seconded by Councillor Mulholland. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Declare that carried. David, thank you. Appreciate that. Ah, oh, David, you're doing the next one as well, and that is um, the private plan change at uh, Felton Matthew. I think there were two submissions, no hearing. Uh, so that is very straightforward as well. Um, briefly, David. So the uh, plan change provides for the rezoning of 90 Thilton Matthew um, in St John's uh, from light industrial to mixed housing suburban. It's a small site, 4,380 square metres. Uh, uh, the submissions received were withdrawn. There was no hearing. Uh, the plan changes beyond challenge, and once again, the report is the final step to make it operative. Thank you. Uh, moved by Councillor Bartley. Do I have a second, please? Councillor Officer Collins. Uh, um, any discussion? I don't think it's necessary. Again, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Contrary, no. Declare that carried. Now, um, we will go to page 207. Now, who's doing... And welcome, Erin. Erin Shields will um, address some appeals that have been resolved. And I think, Erin, you're going to cover... You've got a few slides. And um, Karina from Legal will assist as well. Um, and can I invite Councillor Cooper to move this one? 
Councillor Cooper, do I have a second, please? Councillor Mulholland, thank you. Um, in your hands, Erin, you're going to take us through, you've got a few slides there okay. to look at appeals resolved and appeals outstanding. Uh, thank you, Mr Chair. Um, good morning, everybody. Uh, Duncan, can we just return to the agenda item, please? Because that precedes the slides. Through the chair, uh, this item is to resolve one of the remaining appeals to the decisions that the council made in response to the independent hearing panel recommendations in 2016. The matter was related to the activity status of subdivision in certain parts of the heritage area of the Waitakere Ranges. The Waitakere Ranges Protection Society took a high court proceeding alleging that the council had made an error in law in terms of applying its thinking to keeping the activity status as non-complying. Um, following further consideration by our uh, legal providers, we agreed with them about that and so the High Court appeal was agreed by consent and prohibited activity status was reinstated. Uh, what that meant was that in effect the Council had then rejected the recommendation of the Independent Hearings Panel and that opened the opportunity for submitters to appeal that to the Environment Court. The Council received an appeal from the Strategic Property Advocacy Network and we have been engaged with them for 18 months or so in negotiations. Uh, those negotiations were not particularly successful and the Environment Court directed that the matter be set down for hearing. At that point the Strategic Property Advocacy Network decided to withdraw the appeal. Um, so what that means is that the decision of the High Court and the consent order can now be made operative and I'm seeking the approval of the committee to undertake that action. Essentially the, the matters are now beyond challenge. I hope that made sense. Um, I'm happy to explain those intricacies or get uh, Karina to assist with that if it's particularly legal. I think so. I think um, those that have read the well, we've read the report, and uh, it's it's clear to us it's been a long, um, protracted process. Um, Councillor Cooper knows it well. Former Councillor Penny Hulse knows it well. I'm sure uh, Councillor Shane Henderson's um, knows it well. And uh, I want to acknowledge also uh, local board member Greg Presland, who has played a, a key role as well. Um, taking into account this is a legal. Um, process that we've gone through of recent, but um, the elected members have, have played a, a big role leading up to that uh, legal process. So any questions here, members? There being none, but okay, we'll now proceed to, um, before we vote on this, we're going to address some other matters. Uh, yes, so Duncan, if we can begin the slideshow. Uh, There's a number of remaining appeals from the Council's decisions in 2016 and this is an update of the remaining appeals which there are, I'm pleased to say, few in number and you'll see there is a list which we have a, a slide and we'll quickly run through the legal position in relation to each of them. This is not a uh, asking you as a committee to make any decisions on um, the council's position in relation to each of these matters. Rather, it is simply to update the committee and we're mindful that there are new members following the election last year so that they are up to speed with where we're at with this part of the process. You've heard this morning um, in relation to some plan changes, so these Appeals are not about plan changes, these are about the decisions that were made in 2016, so an earlier process than the plan changes that have been processed since the decisions were made. Next slide, thank you. 
this is where I might hand over to Karina because I'm not particularly familiar with any of these appeals. Um. Okay, um, we've still got the Rural Subdivision Appeals live, which relates to the activity status of subdivision uh, in the rural areas and what opportunities there are for rural subdivision. Um, there was a decision from the Environment Court which was appealed by the Auckland Council. Um, we were quite successful in the High Court and that's been remitted back to the Environment Court. So we'll have a hearing on that this year. Uh, this one is NEIL, and uh, we've got this particular appeal on hold pending the outcome of the IHP revised recommendations, which came about from a Court of Appeal decision. Sure. Look, let's go, I'd like to go through to the end and then we'll ask questions. Thanks. Uh, this is the other related NEIL proceeding. We had a decision from the Court of Appeal which uh, quashed the panel recommendations and the council decisions. We have the IHP reconvened to prepare revised recommendations and I understand that will be occurring this year. Uh, this one is Brookby Quarry. I'm not as familiar with this one but hopefully I have Jenny here and Jenny is very familiar with this file. Oh, good morning, members. Yeah, this this one relates to um, ECAs and quarries and has come down some free, reasonably arcane points around how biodiversity offsetting is going to apply in the quarries. We've essentially reached high levels of agreement with the quarry operators and even with um, Forest and Bird Society, but we just sort of there's some nuances around how those that's represented in the provision. So we are waiting to have the the High Court, sorry, the Environment Court hearing reconvened, and we would expect it to probably go quite quickly once it does. Just for the committee's um, assistance, these are a couple of maps. The one on the left is the Brookby Quarry, and you can see the green cross hatching at the northern end is this significant ecological area. The map on the right places Brookby Quarry in context in relation to Clevedon, which is the nearest um, big town. And hopefully that assists people to understand where Brookby is. Just, just to elaborate, the, the provisions, this, the, the case has been brought and sort of being run predominantly by Brookby from the quarry operators, but the outcomes will reply to all of the quarry areas in the unitary plan. Uh, this one is Pukaki Peninsula, and if you could possibly go back to the last slide. Um, so we had a, a decision from the High Court last year, and they've remitted um, the matters relating to the Pukaki Peninsula which is the Gok land, they've remitted those back to the Environment Court, but the matters relating to Crater Hill, which was the South Family Trust aspect of the appeal, um, those proceedings are at an end. So we've only got uh, the Pukaki Peninsula um, matters going to the Environment Court, and I understand that's going to be heard in the week of 24 February. And that is, uh, to assist the committee, identifies the Pukaki Peninsula in the context of the International Airport and Mungaree Town Centre. And that is a, a zoomed in uh, map that identifies the extent of the area that's still subject to the appeal. And this is on the North Shore. So we uh, we had the Franco Belgiorno Nitas proceedings, which I've updated you on, uh, or we have updated you on over the years. Um, we, we had proceedings that ended last year when uh, the applicant uh, sought leave to appeal to the Supreme Court, and that didn't go ahead. Um, the Court of Appeal had directed that the IHP provide further reasons for the recommendations on zoning in Takapuna. That occurred and that has resulted in further judicial review proceedings from Franco Belgiorno Netas. And the proceedings relate to the zoning of those um, diagonally hatched grey lines. So we have what we refer to as the Lake Road and the Promenade Block. And his challenge um, is in relation to the zonings and the heights that apply to the properties in those particular areas. So those proceedings are likely to be heard uh, this year. 
So that brings us to the end of the slides. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Karina uh, and Erin and Jenny, for that outline. Councillor Walker, please. So, um, microphone, please. Could we go back to the northeastern investments? Thanks. And it's it's um, a bit of a nuisance not being able to ask the question at the time because now it's difficult for me to remember the question. But anyway, that's uh, obviously you're doing, Mr Chair. Um, I can't take responsibility well, I for your memory loss. I, I did try. So, so we've actually um, we've, we've got a situation where the independent hearing panel's recommendations have been um, set aside. Um, is there a, a change in the proposal there now? Can you just give us a, a refresh in terms of what's happening there? Through the chair, I'm, I'm not quite clear what you mean in terms of a change of proposal. They they made a submission on the unitary plan. Um, they uh, didn't get the result that they were seeking and um, took proceedings to challenge the independent hearings panel recommendation and just council decision. Those the recommendations and decision have now been set aside and it needs to go back to the IHP to reconsider. Does that? Um, so what, what things is the IHP reconsidering? They'll need to reconsider the submissions that were made in relation to that tract of land. They'll need to look at all the submissions that were received by the IHP and make new recommendations about uh, the, the zoning and the precinct as they apply to that particular property. Um, issues such as this, because obviously um, it's a few years now since the uh, unitary plan, and obviously prior to that, the submissions and, and the like. So it is, is the decision-making um, process constrained by the prior time frame? Does it take into account development changes that have occurred since around Auckland and around this area? How does that work? So through the Chair, this is not a new process that um, considers the, the environment as it is. It's a process that looks at what was proposed through the unitary plan and the submissions that relate to those proposals. Uh, whether the IHP receives uh, evidence that brings matters up to date and whether they actually accept and include that in their decision is yet to be determined. But it is possible for that to happen? Well, the submitters may well bring such evidence forward, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will be considered. And the other question I've got is on the Franco case, Mr Chair, so perhaps if you could put that... Um, up and, and I do recall the question I had there. Gone too far, okay, and it's 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 a pretty simple question um, because it goes to um, the zoning and and obviously a circumstance we've got an, an appeal and a and a judicial review. So I'm making the assumption that there isn't going to be any change in zoning or the like until the judicial review and the like has run its distance and anything that might develop further from that. So through the chair, the, uh, the zoning as proposed will remain in place until all matters have been resolved at the court. Uh, through the just, uh, well, I'm, I'm still a little that, unclear please. there. Through the chair, I'll just clarify that. Um, because the judicial review is not an appeal, the zoning in the unitary plan is actually operative under Section 86F of the RMA at this point in time. There may be an application made by the applicant for judicial review that seeks to um, put a hold on the zoning being treated as operative, but we have not yet received such an application. At this stage, uh, owners of land in those two blocks of land are able to make an application and the zoning is treated as operative. Okay, so we just... That's good, we've examined that and we're still in legal process um, and hopefully it becomes resolved soon on all of those outstanding matters. So, um, 
We have um, uh, that, is that the end of the. Oh no, I do have questions. Councillor Cashmore, and then Councillor Sayers. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Just to you, uh, Jenny, concerning the uh, Brookby Quarry. So I'm not sure I'm quite clear. So at some point, I'm going to have to explain this to the general public here. Um, so the, the quarry zones are identified in the unitary plan as, as special activity zones. SEA is on top of it. So with this, is this, is this allowing the quarry owners and operators to remove some of the SEA if they do uh, extra um, substitutional planting, or does it put a priority on the quarry zone over the SEA or vice versa? Uh, what, this, well, what happened during the independent hearing panel process was that that panel made the decision that because um, quarrying was so essentially in conflict with protection of the ECAs, that the ECA should come off. So they, they took the ECAs off the quarry land. So at that point, they were just being treated by the normal vegetation clearance rules. Then, uh, um, because of the outcomes of another court case, the Man of War case, which was around the identification of things versus the management of those things, the, the, the implications of that was, while well, you might you might conclude that you want to manage something differently from another area, it doesn't, doesn't mean you shouldn't identify its significance. So, in other words, while, um, while the SEA might not be able to be saved in a quarry situation, that's not reason enough to take the SEA off. So then the SEAs all went back on, and then now we're looking at provisions that should apply to the SEAs and quarry zones. And the upshot of it is we are looking at um, an easier, we are looking at a policy framework that recognises that removal of SEAs and quarries is not always possible to avoid. In fact, it's unavoidable in many circumstances going to happen. So now we're really looking at how the, what the provisions say in relation to that. So even Forest and Bird acknowledged some requirement for, um, you know, some uh, sort of a, a, a less stringent approach, if you like, for quarries and SEA. So now we're talking about what policy framework do we have? How do, what are we saying the rules about it? What sort of offsetting are they required to do? So they, they accept all that stuff. And so it's really, as I say, it's reasonably nuanced now the discussion around the provisions that go in the plan. There are still some outstanding policy issues, but... They, they're pretty at the edges now. Just further clarification, Jenny. Is that going to be, um, those policies are going to be over all quarries in the Auckland region, or are you looking at each different quarry in, in a bespoke manner, either known or unknown? The, the, the appeal covers all all quarry zones. So it, all areas that are identified as quarry zone, the, the provisions that come through this case will apply to all of those quarry zones. So it's not just Brookby, it's all, anywhere that's identified as a quarry zone in the unitary plan. Councillor Sayers, please. Thank you, Mr Chair. Um, I just wanted to gain some clarification around the rural subdivisions. I noticed there were seven uh, appellants there. Uh, just trying to understand if it's a joint, if they're all talking about the same um, issue, or if they're separate issues. Just trying to understand a little bit more about the topics that have been brought up there. Well, essentially, it's... Sorry, Karina. Essentially, it's a council against others at this point. Um, we've got a lot of people who are advocating for, um, who supported the judge's decision around how um, rural subdivisions should play. Again, principally in relation to SEAs. This, this relates um, quite specifically to the kind of bonus provisions that we have in the unitary plan around covenanting and enhancement SEAs in exchange for additional um, subdivision rights. So essentially, it's the council against a lot of parties who want to make it a bit more open than what we have or what we want to have. So. Um, so we, and we've, we've again, we've conceded some points in relation to some of those provisions, but, um, you know, as, as mandated by um, delegated authority, but we have to go back to court and the Environment Court has to reconsider some of those issues. So, yeah, it's going to be interesting to see how that goes, but it's, yeah, it's again, reasonably nuanced, I'd say, at this stage. Uh, thank you, and thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you, Councillor Sayers. That draws us to the end of questions, and uh, I thank Aaron for his report, um, Karina and Jenny for the information and clarifications, um, and um, we'll see how we progress over coming months. Um, it is moved by Councillor Cooper, seconded by Councillor Mulholland. I'll call for a vote. All those in favour say aye. Aye. To the contrary, no. Declare that carried. Just going back to extraordinary business, there's no notice of extraordinary business, so uh, we will move now to item 8, 